many HLFs have you been to? This is my fourth. Right, and so you came the first year after you uh, you got the award. Yeah. How have you seen the changes over the years? Have you noticed changes or? No, I haven't noticed anything. Um, I seem to recall one year there was no boat trip, but uh, other than that, I haven't uh, observed any uh, any change. It was it was great the first year <laughs> I was there, and it's, it seems to have stayed more or less the same. Yeah, but you do keep coming back, so apparently yeah. you like it. Yeah. Well, tell me what you get from it. Uh, well, I get a chance to uh, meet with uh, people and talk about computer science and uh, especially uh, the young researchers. Uh, I don't uh, have much contact uh, with, actually I don't have much contact with other researchers these days uh, and certainly not young ones. Are you still at Microsoft? Yes. Yeah. By the way, I heard about uh, Dr. Thacker, of course. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, don't all around. Yeah, he's a great guy. I uh, occasionally see something that I think, boy, you know, in the newspaper or something, and say, boy, Chuck would enjoy that. And then I remember. Yeah. So actually, since we're talking about five-year periods, five years ago, you, you didn't know that you were winning the Turing Award, I guess. That was right mm -hmm. around the time. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about sort of what, the, what that experience was like going from, from then till now? Uh, well, suddenly a lot of people wanted me to come and give talks. Uh, but uh, it hasn't been any serious uh, you know, change in my life, although uh, it did get me to uh, reflect on my career, something uh, I hadn't really thought about much uh, before then. And what came out of that? Um, I guess uh, a realization of how much I learned from other people uh, in the course of my career. Um, the things that um, I wasn't really very aware of at the time. Uh, for example, um, thinking back on things, uh, especially you know, thinking about, for example, about the work of uh, Edsger Dijkstra. Uh, I realized how much I learned uh, from him without, without realizing it. Um, in the sense that things that I, things that he did and just seemed perfectly natural to me, uh, I realized later that he was the first one to do it. Uh, in particular, his way of reasoning, I would say mathematically, about uh, programs, or we call them then programs, I think. Uh, now a little realistic, more realistic, and the things we were calling programs, I think, are better called algorithms because they generally didn't have the complexities and you know all the complications that real programs have. Uh, but you know that work on algorithms has led to uh, um, reasoning about real programs these days. Uh, but. Um, just a way of, of thinking about it, in particular, um, viewing a, an execution of a program as a sequence of states. Now that's something that, it wasn't even mentioned explicitly by Dijkstra, that this is what he was doing. But if you just look at how the reasoning went, it's clear that that was the mathematics that was underlying it. And um, I guess now I you know, tell people that's the, that's the right way to think about uh, uh, algorithms and systems. Um, and it, uh, it seems so natural to me that it seems strange when people don't immediately understand it. 
uh, so that was one example. Uh, one thing that I guess reminded me and made me feel a little more guilty about, I may have mentioned it last uh, time I spoke to you, uh, that the I mean, most famous uh, paper, the Time Clocks paper, um, one of the things it uses uh, time stamps, that is, uh, stamps with the, the time according to the sender's clock put on the message. And that idea came from a paper that someone sent me. Uh, that paper is, is cited in my, in my paper, but uh, I realized maybe <laughs> decades later that they invented the idea of using timestamps. And I didn't realize, I just assumed that, oh, this is what everybody did. <laughs> and uh, so now I'm often cited as, you know, having uh, original, originated the idea of using timestamps and, uh, you know, feel that it's uh, unfortunate that, you know, I didn't, uh, understand that this was a new idea that they had used, so I would have mentioned in my paper that, you know, using the idea of X and Y in, uh, you know, evading timestamps will do this. Who was the person? Do you remember? Uh, Bob Thomas and Paul Johnson, their names. Uh, they were at BBN, I believe. Um, did you ever meet either, either them or Dr. Dykstra? Oh, sure. Uh, had a long, uh, I, I've seen, talked to Edsker uh, many times over the years. Uh, I think I irritated him uh, to a large extent because uh, I, uh, he had strong ideas and I had strong ideas and uh, you know, I was one of the few computer scientists who weren't intimidated by him. <laughs> Not for any good reason, just because uh, um, I never felt that, uh, you know, it was not like he was a mathematician or a physicist or somebody who did something difficult. He just did computer science like I did. <laughs> It's funny that you mentioned his papers and then the other, the time clock papers, mm -hmm. um, which is something that Dr. Hoare said, because I asked, who are your mentors? And he named papers rather than people. Were there people that you would consider mentors, or did you tend to learn more from, from papers? Uh, the mentors, the people who I think affected me the most, because they got to me when I was younger, uh, are not people anyone has heard of. Uh, the, when I was fresh out of high school and uh, I uh, really started with working with computers and I had a summer job at uh, Con Edison, the electric utility in New York City. Uh, there was someone there, oh God, whose name I'm blocking on, Norman. I don't even remember his last name. Uh, he sort of, well, I think he recognized that I was smart. And he, uh, he acted as a mentor to me. Uh, not mostly uh, in the way of he would give me little puzzles to solve and uh, you know, point things out to me. And uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not exa exactly sure what constitutes mentoring. Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, and also, I guess, I realized uh, my de jure thesis advisor, Dick Palais, uh, and how much I learned from him. And where was that? At Brandeis Graduate School. Uh, you know, we've, you know, mathematicians have heard of him. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've become friends over the years, uh, still in touch with him. Now, you're sort of unusual in a sense that you, uh, you're not a professor. You're not uh, coming into daily contact with, 
with people. And again, this, this question of what is mentoring, I mm -hmm. guess, if I were to say, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, uh, acting as a model of how to think and perhaps how to behave or how to approach problems or something mm -hmm. like that. Uh, have you been in that position for others besides at the HLF? Um, as I said, I'm not sure what constitutes mentoring, but um, I've had, um, well, I have now uh, someone who's working for me who's uh, in uh, Germany, and uh, he's been doing uh, programming on the uh, TLA Plus tools. And, um, you know, I try to give him, uh, I try to teach him some things, you know, as we go along. And uh, and I worry about you know whether I'm you know he's really getting as much as as he could if you know I'm paying enough attention to uh, trying to to teach him things. Uh, I've had you know a few uh, young uh, students uh, like that. Uh, uh, you know, a very good intern uh, one year at uh, INRIA and uh, who uh, uh, was sufficiently somehow inspired by what he was doing. He was uh, working on, on the tools, but you know, he learned from TLA and using mathematics to, to reason about uh, algorithms. And when he decided to go to grad school, uh, he got into, he was, did it in uh, verification. So I guess I had some effect on him. Uh, I hope it was a good one. <laughs> it's not a very fashionable field these days. You mean verification is yeah. a very fashionable field. Actually, let's talk, and I'm just checking the time, and, and then I'll check the questions as well, but let's talk about um, what your passion is now, which I guess you would say is verification in TLA+. Um, yeah, it's, I'm not sure it's so much my passion in the sense that uh, It's sort of something that I, I feel I should be doing, I think, more than other things in my career. Uh, because I feel like I have something important uh, to teach to engineers. And, you know, I want to make sure that they get it. Uh, and it just doesn't get forgotten when I retire. So that's why I'm well, making a series of videos on TLA, so you know they'll have me around even after I do retire, uh, and uh, doing the best I can to get tools built. And, and how are those videos and tools available? Uh, go on the website and look for TLA uh, or Temporal Logic of Actions, and uh, there's a major you know the home page of that and links heading to the videos and the tools and all of that stuff. Well, uh, TLA Plus actually is, uh, uh, works, be works best that will get them to work directly to the right page. Yeah. I imagine TLA stands for a lot of other things. Some, <laughs> yes, some of them uh, less savory perhaps. <laughs> uh, three letter acronym is my favorite. <laughs> yes. But uh, actually I think TLA has been getting up in the uh, web search rankings. Your TLA. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. good. <laughs> I think, but I, I guess I, I search TLA plus when I want to find the web page. I don't remember the URL. <laughs> so let's, uh, so again, going back to the five-year theme, mm -hmm. uh, in your wildest imaginings, in your, in your most successful dreams, where would you like to see this project go in five years? Uh, well, my success. Well, the project itself uh, is. Uh, I would like to see you know engineers everywhere. <laughs> uh, well, I'd like engineers everywhere thinking 
about what they're doing before they sit down and start coding. And I'd like engineers, uh, ones who are building uh, complex distributed systems, uh, to be using TLA plus. Because, uh, Obviously, I think it's great for, for that purpose. Um, and my real wildest dreams, um, I would like to see computer science education change so that um, students are taught less about programming languages than about what those languages are saying in particular, to think about a computation as a sequence of states. And uh, that to understand uh, what these programming languages are doing in, in those terms. Because I have a sense that um, students these days think of programming language as being, a, as, as being a collection of magic incantations. And they sort of have some vague idea of what they do, but uh, not really a clear conception. And that's because people don't explain it to them in terms of you know, a sequence of states. Um, for example, um, Object-oriented programming. Now, object-oriented programming is—it's—it's uh, it's, it's very nice. You know, it has—it's—it's it's made for better programming languages. But I don't think uh, beginning students or understand that what they're doing is when they have an object and they're min you know, this thing that they call an object, is really simply a pointer to some piece of data sitting somewhere. And there's a lot of confusion between the pointer and the data it's pointing to. And the, I think that programming language people want to think of um, the object-oriented languages as um, allowing people to think of these wonderful thing called, things called objects and not in terms of pointers. And a matter of fact, you know, pointer is a, is a, a four-letter word, I think, in, in programming languages these days, you know, because uh, C, for example, is a terribly ugly language because it allows you to do arithmetic on pointers. And uh, you, know, you shouldn't be doing that because you shouldn't, you know, a pointer is sort of pointing you to something, but you shouldn't care exactly what that, where that thing is or you know, what number in memory <laughs> you know, that piece of where the, where the program and where the, the data is being stored. You should just, but you should realize that Another word for a pointer might be for a name for it. Uh, but you should realize that there's a distinction between the name, <laughs> or the pointer, and the data that's being named. And object-oriented programming languages tend to obscure that uh, distinction. And but people are so hung up in languages that you get some real silliness like object-oriented specification languages. Now, specification language is something that you know, specifies basically what a program is supposed to do rather than how it does it. And so what verification means is that a program implements its specification. It does what its specification says it should do. And so somebody, I, I won't name any names, uh, you know, devised this object-oriented uh, specification language. 
And as he, I don't remember what the example was, but he gave some example of something written in his language. And I realized that uh, it was much more complicated than it needed to be because it did not make the separation between the, ob the, the, the name of the, of the data and the data itself. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when I you know, took that same specification, I would nowadays write it in TLA, but I, it was even before TLA, but just you know, writing it in, you know, in whatever way I was writing specifications in those days, which wasn't object-oriented. So when you, to describe the data, you actually had to describe you know, the set of names and the set of things that the names could be naming. But having this set of names allowed me to write a much more sensible specification. And this was the example, you know, the first example that he used for how wonderful his you know, object-oriented specification language was. Uh, is there any final comment you'd like to make just generally about um, either the forum or about, I know that the, the topic of mentoring is not one that, that you tend to expand on uh, a lot, mm -hmm. but... Um, I, I, don't, I don't have anything <laughs> uh, intelligent to say about it. Well, other how about, than how about the continuity of, of, of you know, your field and, and your work and, you know? Uh, I think I feel less the continuity than the change. And, you know, which is great. Uh, I just hope that the, you know, like, uh, for example, you know, I think that, you know, I've learned a lot about writing specifications. And what I hope is that people will say, oh, yeah, you know, you now understand how to write specifications, let's go on to do something else. And rather than just have what we've learned forgotten and you know, have to have somebody else reinvent it someday. So yeah, I think uh, uh, I do tend to see more of a, uh, the change than the, the continuity. And I think it's a good thing. Seems like a good place to end. Thank you very much. Thank you.